to the Leo Training Podcast with Joe DeLeo. You'll hear in-depth interviews and tips from world-class athletes, coaches, and industry-leading experts to help you train smarter and improve at what you love to do. Train smarter, get stronger, move better, race faster. Here's your host, Joe DeLeo. We're back with episode 85 of the Leo Training Podcast. And my guest this week is Joel Proskowitz. Joel is an internationally acclaimed strength coach and health and fitness expert. His unique approach focuses on effective, tailored training and rehabilitation programs that achieve results that really last. Joel is in excess of 30,000 hours of training and has worked with a wide range of clients, including Olympic medalists, business executives, rehabilitation patients, and families keen to improve their long-term fitness and health. Joel works closely with Professor Stuart McGill, Professor Emeritus of Spinal Biomechanics at the University of Waterloo in Canada, and they focus on the rehabilitation of lower back pathologies. He's also an assistant instructor for Professor McGill on the McGill Clinical Courses and a lead instructor for the McGill Trainer Courses. In this interview, Joel and I sit down and discuss the approach that he takes. And one of the unique things that Joel does that separates himself from other strength and conditioning coaches that specialize in low back rehabilitation is Joel sits in and views spine surgeries. So he is very familiar with what is going on with the individual that he will be working with in a rehabilitation setting. He is seeing... Uh, the surgery up close in person. Uh, This is something that uh, I've heard no other strength and conditioning coach doing. So you'll hear firsthand from Joel how this impacts his training uh, with that person. Joel and I also discuss some of the work that he did with the 2000 Olympic Sydney men's pair from South Africa and the training that they undertook. He also provides some good principles for rowers uh, that they can incorporate into their training. So without further ado, let's roll to episode 85. I'm very pleased to welcome on Joel Proskowitz onto the Leo Training Podcast. Joel, thanks so much for coming on to the show and taking time out of your busy schedule uh, to share some of your wisdom and expertise with the strength and conditioning and rehabilitation communities. Joe, thanks very much. Uh, it's an absolute honor to be uh, asked on the show, and uh, I look very forward to to sharing some insights with you guys and, and your listeners. Me too. Yeah, we've got a great show in store for the audience, and uh, yeah, it was it was absolutely an honor to have the opportunity to meet you in person uh, last month last month at the uh, Perform Better Conference in Providence, Rhode Island. So very very cool. Been following your work for uh, some time now, so I'm glad we got a chance to kind of sit sit down. Uh, face to face, pseudo, pseudo, yeah, pseudo. <laughs> that's, t- that's technology these days. Hey? That's right. Um, so yeah, so I'm looking forward to this. We got a great show in store. So why don't we just kind of start things off and why don't you share, uh, kind of your journey, your, your background, um, into the strength and conditioning field and, uh, you know, just your journey along the way and, and where you are currently and, and who you're working with. Sure. No problem. So, <clears throat> Joe, I'll go back, uh, or at least my entry into the uh, into the industry goes back uh, close on 25 years ago, uh, probably about 24 if I'm, if I'm exact. And um, I got into it um, through uh, the, a very, very dear friend of mine who became a mentor uh, of mine, and uh, we were both involved in the karate world, um, and he was one of the very first uh, certified strength and conditioning coaches in South Africa. And uh, he took me in under his wing. And what materialized from that was uh, the two of us had actually set up or we, we uh, went on to set up the one of the very first um, personal training facilities in Johannesburg, South Africa, uh, back in 1996. So I'd already been in the uh, in the industry then for about two and a half years. And uh, going back that long ago into South Africa, personal training was pretty much unheard of, Joe. 
Um, and you always had to, it was quite a hard sell and, you know, you, you had to convince people uh, as to what you did and verify, you know, who, who you were um, to get them to sign up with you to do personal training. But um, our facility took off because we uh, pretty much specialized in orthopedic rehab. Uh, and I, and when I talk about orthopedic rehab, I'm talking, you know, we were we were thrown into the deep end with regards to post-operative ACL recovery, uh, shoulder recovery, both pre-post-operative. Um, didn't really deal a lot with lower back problems in those days. Uh, maybe it just wasn't on my radar as it uh, as strongly as it is today. But uh, and that's that's how the, the the journey started. And I was uh, I worked with my business partner for. Um, just on on about eleven and a half years uh, before my wife and I decided to emigrate to uh, to the UK. And uh, now to expedite the story, um, I now have a home which is Performance RX. Uh, it's taken me it took me about nine years to to get this uh, in in London. Um, I've had ups and downs as most people will have in their business. And now Performance RX is a three thousand square foot facility. Um, it houses a full strength and conditioning and rehab, uh, 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 sort of playground, so to speak. And, uh, downstairs I've got four treatment rooms, um, pretty large treatment rooms for London. So I'm, I'm very lucky. And downstairs we've got uh, physical therapists, we've got osteopaths, we've got chiropractors, we've got massage therapists. So I've got a really good team, um, that allows me to, really assist a potential patient and or client. So if there are certain things that I don't have the expertise and skills to do, like I'm not a manual therapist um, and I will never profess to be, you know, someone that, that knows manual therapy. Um, I've got hands on manual therapists here that can intervene um, and give me, or at least give the client a, a, a full experience that just allows them to, um, you know, to have a, all the expertise at hand. So that's that's pretty much in a very shortened version my my 24 25 years of of being involved in uh, in the in the fitness industry. Wow, that's that's pretty incredible. So couple couple questions. So the way that you've kind of structured performance RX, you you have the ability when you're working with uh you know a, a client to kind of take them if they need to go from you know, the, literally the training room floor uh, into a into a treatment room, kind of within that session, if need be, to get you know whether it's hands on manual therapy work or, um, you know, like like you said, maybe there's an evaluation or something hands on that you may not be uh, licensed to do as a strength and sure. conditioning coach. Um, sure. That you know, just moving them across the facility instead of they have to schedule that appointment or go to see somebody else on a different time, a different day. They can get all that in house at one, one place. They, they pretty much can Joe. Obviously there's logistics that we've got to overcome. So for example, if the therapists are busy at that stage, but generally um, <clears throat> everything is run through our reception desk. So we have the ability, even if the client can't see the therapist within the context of that session, they can pretty much, see the therapist either half an hour later or, or maybe 30 minutes before the session. Um, but we've got everything under one roof. And that was my goal in creating Performance Rx is I, firstly, I never want to be everything to everybody because I'll just never be able to specialize and uh, have the skills to, to really do what I do well. Um, and also I know that um, I've been in the game long enough to truly understand what I don't know. So, um, as I say, when it comes to, to utilizing the therapist, I wanted to have a, 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 a facility that would allow me to have like-minded professionals who have all been screened by me uh, to make sure that we're on the same page to essentially look after the clients. Because for me, um, it's the customer experience, experience or the client experience that, is, that trumps everything. So when the, when the customer or client comes in here, I want them to make sure that they feel very comfortable utilizing the therapist downstairs. They feel very comfortable upstairs or, or you know, whether it be with one of my trainers or, you know, under, under my care. Um, and then 
essentially, from a commercial perspective, that just allows the, the client to feel very comfortable and come back time and time again. So I'm very lucky, Joe. I really haven't, over my, my all, all my years involved, I haven't really had to market myself. I, I don't... And I don't send out flyers. We don't uh, market performance RX at all. Everything is word of mouth. Everything is referral from uh, fellow clinicians and osteopaths and other physical therapists who don't work here mm-hmm. um, and orthopedic surgeons for that matter. Um, so it's, it's, I've managed to fall into uh, a nice um, environment of organic referrals, organic growth, uh, which allows me then just to focus on what I do well. Um, and then obviously I've got my other professionals who are very, very highly um, skilled at what they do. And it just works really well. That's fantastic. Excellent. Yeah. Um, so one question I have for you. So, you know, you started off in, in um, you know, 1996. At that point you had, you said two, two and a half years of experience and opened that first facility in Johannesburg. Um, so how did you, like, at what point in your career or was it just sort of experiences that you had working with, with certain clients that kind of led you down the path to knowing, all right, I want to go from kind of strictly doing, you know, personal training and becoming or having this facility or, or a professional reputation of working with individuals coming out of, uh, rehabilitation for, you know, surgery or orthopedic rehabilitation. You know, I think, um, it, again, it was, it was a natural evolution, Joe. So what happened was when we started off, because personal training was uh, pretty much an unknown entity in South Africa back in those days, um, we never got involved, my business partner and I never, ever got involved in any type of body transformation and uh, typical, if I can say, typical personal training. So very, very rarely in the early days did people ever come to us uh, and, and ask us to, you know, give them a six week body transformation. Cause those things were unheard of because of, you know, now I suppose with the advent of Facebook and social media, those things are a lot more out there and people sort of understand them a bit more. So what we managed to do was, um, again, we were set up in an area of Johannesburg, uh, where, where it was a little bit of an older population and people had had their time either in the gym or on the sports field and when they came to us, they were generally referred to us from other clinicians or the or the orthopedic surgeons or, or neurosurgeons who we were friendly with in South Africa. And it just made um, sense for us to start looking uh, down the down the lens of the rehabilitation route more than the typical personal training route. And I never really gave it two thoughts because I wasn't exposed to anything else but orthopedic rehabilitation. Uh, However, my qualification, my background, um, I wasn't a physical therapist. So a lot of it was trial by error. Um, I actually, I was was talking to to a a colleague of mine the other day about the very first time I'd ever had to deal with a post-ACL rehab client. Um, I would never, ever disclose the story and and, and the training protocol of what I was doing back in uh, 1996 because I think it was all wrong, but again, it was it was baptism by fire, so to speak. Um, and then that led me to study a lot uh, every year in the U.S. I'd go back to all the NSCA conferences. Uh, I would then obviously, when Perform Better started, I'd, I'd go back to the Perform Better conferences. Uh, and then it just it was an organic growth uh, and just a natural evolution to to go down the route of fixing up injuries. Yeah, and do you, do you find um, it's, it's per particularly rewarding kind of working with, with that type of client because they're, they're trying to, you know, whether they're an athlete or just a, a regular individual, um, you know, they're, they're trying to get back to a, a quality of life and kind of restore some, some ability that either is lost or has been taken away, um, versus, you know, working with an individual on the, as you said, the body transformation side of things or uh, strictly on sp- sports performance? Well, if, if we compare it to the body transformation, Joe, I, again, I can only say that 
I'm so inexperienced with regards to six week or 12 week transformations that my interest, I have no interest in that. So for me, when, when someone comes in who is injured, whether it be an athlete or a, or a uh, just gen, gen pop, um, it, it, it's, it's very rewarding for me to be successful with them. Um, because the, you know, when, when I get the emails or when I get the telephone calls to say, you know, Joel, um, I, I'll give an example earlier. I was, uh, today at 11 o'clock, I was dealing with uh, a woman who's, who's come to see me for, uh, quite a few, quite a few musculoskeletal issues, but she's got some, some serious back, back issues and we've got to work very slowly. This is a long-term client that I've got to, you know, we've got to look uh, over probably a period of a year to, to 18 months to really get her going because she's had some massive trauma uh, to her spine. But she turned around to me as she left the gym this, this morning and she said, Joel, I've got to tell you something. Just the little bit that you've done for me has honestly changed my life. And, you know, I just thought to myself, it's, it's really good to hear that. It's, it's very gratifying to hear that. Um, and, and I don't know whether I've changed her life. I wouldn't be so arrogant to believe that I have. But just maybe the uh, the ability to just feed her a little bit of what she requires so that she can assimilate that and actually apply it to her own life. She's made herself better, but I've just maybe guided her to that position. Because as I say, you know, I, I, I don't uh, I'm, I'm not beholden to 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 any one particular thought process that I believe I, I hold the panacea to 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 making people, you know, universally better. Um, maybe I just know how to feed them the right stuff at the right time. So it, it's very gratifying, Joe, very. Um, I, I don't think I would get the same satisfaction from someone who said to me, you know, oh, Joel, you've taken me from 13% body fat to 10% and now I look good in my wedding dress. It just, and, and, and I'm, all, I'm all good for that. And, and I've, I, I, I totally, totally respect that. But it's just not a world that I've ever lived in. Sure. No. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, so. I would agree. I think, uh, working with those types of indiv individuals that are, that are coming back from injury, um, it's very rewarding, you know, getting yeah. them back to a place where they feel very confident in, um, their strength and how they're moving, you know, sure. and just kind of having the confidence really to go through, their daily life and not feel like, uh, they're walking on eggshells, so to speak. You know, well, it's funny what you say, Joe, because it, it takes me back to South Africa. I'll never forget. I, um, I was referred a, a, a very prominent businessman in South Africa, uh, who wanted to come and train with me. And, uh, you know, this is a gentleman who was running a company with 3000 employees, global offices, you know, a multi-billion dollar corporation. And so he, he didn't suffer fools gladly. And he, he turned around to me and he said to me once, he said, Joel, you see, you know, 10 clients a day. He said, don't you get bored doing the same thing? And I turned around to him and I said, that's the funny thing. I said, the perception is that you think I do the same thing. But when I see 10 different people a day, it's 10 very different things every single day. So I suppose for me, it's, it's a mental game, Joe, where if I'm seeing 50 or 55 people a week, um, I, I'm shot by, by Sunday, man. I'm done because I've put in a huge amount of mental effort and mental energy, not just, uh, you know, prescribe a bird dog or a plank or whatever it is. It's, it's, it, there's a whole host that goes into it. Um, and my clients are very appreciative to know that the energy that I put in is not just, well, I've written down a couple of exercises, go off and do it and let's hope for the best. Um, so again, it, it is an element of gratification because maybe in a game where people perceive that you don't really need to be, um, uh, that mentally tuned in, um, I'm doing the opposite. I'm really, really putting in a huge amount of, you know, mental energy. And, and, and I think if you're a trainer and you, you're getting to the top of your game, um, you'll know that it's, it's not just a question of just prescribing an exercise. You know, there's a very, very calculated, uh, thought process as to what goes on and, and how you, how you deal with people. Oh yeah, absolutely. I couldn't agree more. And, and not just the, um, you know, uh, selecting the appropriate exercise for that individual, uh, at that point in time, kind of where they are. Um, but you know, sometimes, 
tuning it uh, to their specific uh, needs and then also really, you know, making following through, making sure that they're, uh, you know, doing their homework, so to speak. Sure, absolutely. And again, like anything, you know, uh, I've had many discussions with Professor McGill about about Vince Lombardi. Um, I'm sure you know who I'm, I'm talking about. And, um, you know, Vince Lombardi said it best. He was asked the question, you know, how come uh, you, know, you know football so well? And he turned around and he said, son, it's not that I know the game of football very well. He said, it's I know men. And I suppose when, when you get to understand your clients and you get to understand human interactions, uh, that really uh, does a whole host of positive things for you as a trainer because, again, the way I would prescribe a particular exercise for my 11 o'clock lady who came in today is going to be very different to how I prescribe it to my 26-year-old young buck guy who comes in at 6 o'clock tonight. And and the way that I, I sell it to them, the way that I give it to them, the way that I uh, teach them and what cues I utilize, it's all different. It's all right. very different. Right. Yeah, that's the, that's the uh, you know, that's the interesting part um, because it's, you really have to individualize it uh, to that particular person and stuff. And so on the surface, you know, it, it very well could be the same exercise that two different individuals are doing, but how it's taught and how they learn it is completely different. Very different, man. And, and, th- and that's the art of, of uh, the, the game that we're in. Yeah. Love that. That's great. Good man. <laughs> um, so with that being said, so, um, kind of coming back uh, to the original question. So as you kind of evolved in your career, how have you come to a point where you're really, um, you know, focusing uh, and specializing in a lot on, on low back rehabilitation? Um, you know, was that sort of, again, just a natural metamorphosis or did that also come about um, when you met Dr. McGill or, or I guess a better question is how, how did you get you to me? <laughs> so many people have asked me that question, Joe. So <clears throat> what had happened was I was in South Africa and every year over a period of 10 years, I went to the NSCA conferences. Um, and in about 2004, um, I got engaged and that year I just – um, I never had the finances because, you know, in South Africa back then, it was very expensive to fly to the U.S. And I never had the finances to go to the NSCA conference and to to get married that year. So my business partner went and uh, I was actually battling at that stage with uh, some back issues. But in South Africa, the only diagnosis that we would ever have would be uh, like a consultant, neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon looking at MRI scans and saying, well, you know, there's your problem. Because at, at that stage, there was no such thing as, as movement screening and no such thing as, or at least in South Africa, as, as people truly understanding, you know, what movements and postures and loads and um, <clears throat> certain things would, would amplify your pain or, or decrease your pain. So my business partner flew off to the, uh, to the NSCA conference and he came back and he said to me, Joel, I've heard the best keynote speaker I've ever heard at the NSCA conference. And I bought you his book because I know you're battling with your back. And he threw down lo- the first edition of Low Back Disorders on my on my desk. And Joe, I worked through this book. And honestly, man, the, you know, I've said this and it's, it's out in the public domain. But I, the first time I read that book, I didn't understand a single thing. I was like, Wow, this is this is like a serious <laughs> textbook, you know. And um, I, I moved through that book uh, probably about three or four times. Um, and then at, the more I was reading it, the more it was making sense. And the reason it made sense to me, Joe, was not because of my involvement in the personal training industry. It made sense to me because by that stage, I had been doing a traditional Shotokan karate martial art for 20 years. That, that, that's my background. I'm a martial artist. And when I was reading Stu's work, I thought, wow, there's a lot of principles here that we intrinsically use without much thought in the world of martial arts. You know, the, the bracing and, 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 and creating power from the hips and, 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 and creating movement from the shoulders. And the more I read it, the more I could correlate my time on the, on the karate floor 
to what Stu was saying. And it just started to make sense. And then through through low back disorders, I started to apply some of the stuff, um, uh, albeit quite raw, because I didn't I didn't know what I was really doing when, when I was working my way through the book. And then about a year later, I immigrated to, to the UK. And um, I heard that Stu was coming over um, at the end of the year to come speak at a medical conference. Anyway, I, I BSed my way into this medical conference. It was only for like orthopedic surgeons and neurosurgeons and everyone else. Anyway, I, 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 I don't know. Obviously, I must have done it pretty well. And uh, I contacted Stu and I said, listen, I'm coming to this conference. Um, would you mind just assessing me and, and maybe we can meet? And he said, look, Joel, he goes, I literally get thousands of requests a day. He goes, if you come to the conference, come and introduce yourself and I'll give you five minutes. Cut a long story short, Joe, uh, at the end of the conference, after Stu had given his talk, he got absolutely bombarded and people were just, you know, pulling him left, right and center with questions and everything else. And, you know, Stu, he gets very flustered and, you know, he doesn't like too many people. He wants to just sit and have a beer. And I'd already introduced myself to him at lunchtime and he turned around and he said, sorry, everyone. He goes, I've got to give Joel, uh, you know, I've got, I've got some time to, I need to spend with Joel. And he grabbed me and he pulled me and he said, oh, I just needed to get out of there. He said, come, let's have a beer. And we sat down and he said, look, I've got five minutes for you. He said, let me look at your back. Let me see what's happening. And then literally to cut a long story short, Joe, five minutes turned into three hours and three hours has now turned into 12 years. So Stu and I just, we hit it off straight away and I get him, I get how he thinks. Um, I've traveled in, you know, a lot with Stu now. Um, and, and I've done his course, you know, probably more than, than any other person, uh, has, has, has done it. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it just, it sits really well with me. Um, and I've said this many times before, and I'll say it again. I have been influenced greatly by many strength and conditioning coaches, many professionals in this industry. And I must tell you, I tip my hat to, to all of them that have shaped me, but Stu, as a non-strength and conditioning person, as a, as a biomechanics research professor, has probably had the greatest influence on my strength and conditioning career than anyone else. Because I always say this, I would say nine out of 10 times, most things originate in the spine. You know, most pathologies, go back to the spine, go take a look at it, see how the spine is functioning. And I've applied a lot of Stu's principles into just teaching my trainers how to work here and, and just working with general population and just generally adhering to really good biomechanics. Uh, yeah, it takes care of the spine. Again, it's in context because people will listen to this and say, oh, but, you know, you, you've got to do other things as well. Yes, I know that. Um, but uh, also when you apply Stu's research and his biomechanics into just general training, which I've managed to do that, things work out well. And and Joe, I, I'm 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 really happy to say that our injury rate at Performance RX is is virtually nil. In fact, not virtually, it is nil. Um, on the basis that we know how to apply the correct my, uh, biomechanics uh, with the uh, appropriate load at the appropriate time for the appropriate person. And all of it has really stemmed from a good, deep understanding of what Stu has put out there. So uh, that has really been my journey into understanding and getting to know the back really, really well. Um, I've still got a hell of a lot to learn, and I still immerse myself in a, in a lot of uh, uh, research and texts about how the spine moves and how it functions and uh, every day, but uh, I must say, it's you know, I, I probably have extrapolated a whole bunch of stuff from Stu's work that that many people haven't been able to do. Yeah, that's just incredible. Um, thank you so much for for sharing that. That's that's really uh, interesting to hear, kind of the backstory and everything. But but uh, also just sort of your journey along understanding more about um, you know the spine and, and the back and kind of overcoming, uh, some of the troubles that you were having. Um, yeah. but yeah, I, I totally agree. The, the principles, um, that kind of Stu has outlined in, in his books. Um, you know, I, I, I use them every day as well. And, 
it kind of comes back earlier to, to what you had said, you know, there's the, the science and then there's the art part and, and the art is really kind of being able to uh, develop a, a keen sense and an eye for dialing in and tuning the appropriate load and the appropriate exercise selection or the progression regression of that exercise to that sure. individual at that time at their ability level. Sure. Um, so that we're promoting, uh, you know, positive adaptation and we're not, you know, uh, de distressing them. We're, we're, yeah. we're causing you, you stress. So yeah, that's, um, <laughs> when I hear you say you, you've still got a, a hell of a lot more to learn. I'm like, yeah, I'm, I'm at the probably the very <laughs> beginning of my journey as well then. Oh so. man. Uh, now, honestly, Joe, for me, I always, um, I always think that I'm still at the bottom rung of the ladder and ma maybe, uh, that has worked against me, um, uh, in the past because I'm only now starting to get out there on a bit more of a public platform and with social media and lecturing uh, all over the world. But I now feel confident that um, I know just a little bit and that I'm really good at that little bit and I can, I can put it out there. Um, but for me, it's, it's, it's a constant learning curve. I'm constantly reading podcasts. I've listened to most of your podcasts that you've put out there. Thank you so um, much. I no, no, no. It's, it's, you, you know, you've had some great guests on. And, and the thing is, even if what I'm learning now just reconfirms that what I'm doing is right, then that's enough for me. Um, but I, I don't profess to know it all. I don't profess to, to, to have all the answers. Hence why I spend time with, you know, guys like Stu and Charlie Weingoff and go to perform better and, and all those type of things because there's some very, very smart people out there. Uh, I may not agree with everyone, but that's okay. That's because I work with a particular demographic and I've got a, a particular business model. But um, at least I've got a toolbox that I've got in enough tools to choose from uh, to deal with my particular clientele. And that works for me. It works really well because – uh, it, it obviously does because if I haven't marketed performance RX and we're really busy, uh, and I still do 50, you know, 50 to 60 contact hours a week, then obviously I'm, I'm doing something right. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, <laughs> clearly you're, <laughs> you're knocked off your feet with, uh, with work and staying busy. As you said, your diary is full. Yeah, yeah, it sure is, man. It sure is. Yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Um, so next, next kind of question I have for you, um, I think this is something that is incredibly uh, noteworthy and interesting that you do and, um, you know, uh, falls under continuing uh, being a student and learning and, and developing your, your skill set is uh, once a month you sit in and observe a spinal surgery. Um, and, and you had kind of shared that when we had met at the Perform Better conference. And I thought that was just absolutely fascinating um, you know, because one, again, you're, 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 you're not a clinician, you're not a surgeon. Um, but the interest and, um, you know, the, the willingness to immerse yourself in the subject matter and learn as much as you can to be as, uh, proficient as you can skill wise is, you know, you're, you're, you're really putting yourself out there. So one, how did you, what, you know, what, brought about that what was the backstory on that or what made you decide that that was something you wanted to do and, and how did that happen and then what what is that like kind of kind of if you could set the stage dressing the environment of this training room floor versus kind of the, the being on the surgery table so to speak sure no problem so the very first time i was ever exposed to that joe was back in south africa now um you, you got to you got to recall that back in South Africa in the early nineties, uh, there was no, uh, especially in our industries and the medical industry, if we can use that as an umbrella, there were no really big restrictions. So, in other words, if an orthopedic surgeon wanted to refer directly to me, they could. They didn't have to, by law, refer to a physical therapist who, in turn, would then clear the patient to go and train. Hence, why the experience that I've had is probably very, very unique. Um, so I'll never forget, we, we worked very closely with a, with a knee orthopedic surgeon in South Africa, a fantastic surgeon in, in his day. Um, and he used to train at our gym. And he would always say to my business partner and I, anytime you want to see like an ACL repair or a knee replacement, 
just give my secretary a call and you can come and observe. And uh, we, we took him up on that. And I literally got addicted. Um, I went to go see my first ACL repair. Um, and then um, I just got, uh, for me, it was a rude awakening because I now got to see um, how injuries are repaired surgically. And then it naturally just started to, to evolve from knees to hips to shoulders. Um, so now, I, now I've seen uh, under my belt, I've got spinal surgery, shoulder surgery, knee surgery, um, hip surgery. I haven't seen open heart. I don't think I've got the guts to do that just yet. <laughs> I'll, I'll wait and see. But um, I, I've seen most of the uh, common operations that are performed and now what I do is I work with a lot of surgeons um, around my area here and we, we've all become you know really good friends and uh, they invite me all the time or I'll just contact their secretary and they don't really do it very often for, for other people but I've just managed to again create great relationships whereby uh, they're very happy to have me there so, you know, they, they, they just, you know, they, they get patient consent. We have to do that legally. Uh, and, and the patient is, uh, believes that I'm a, a, either a physical therapist or an osteopath, um, or they, they know that I'm involved in rehabilitation. Um, and when you walk in to that theater, things change because there you're seeing someone lying there putting all their trust in this particular, uh, surgeon's skills to really sort out their pathology and fix them up so that they can get back into the gym and get strong and go and enjoy their 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 their, their daily living again and it's quite a humbling experience because when you get to see some heavy you know surgical procedures like I've seen you know I've seen anterior fusions that's where you know they'll they'll go uh, uh, cut you open through your abdominals and the first part of the surgery is performed by a cardiothoracic or a cardiovascular surgeon where they've basically got to move, you know, your, 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 your stomach and its contents and all your, your major arteries and everything. They've got to, you know, move it aside so that the orthopedic surgeon has got clear view of your spinal column from the front. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm, I've literally been, you know, uh, a, a, an arm's length away from the patient looking at their spine, you know, while, while they're completely open. Um, and what it's really done for me, Joe, is that when a client comes in to see me, and I, as I say, I, I've seen some really, really traumatized spines. I've seen people with three level fusions and two disc replacements. I've seen people that have had, you know, three or four revision fusion surgeries. So when they tell me what has happened to them, I've seen that. I've seen that surgical procedure being done, and it gives me a very clear understanding as to what has happened inside of their spine. So that puts me in a way stronger position to prescribe, again, the, the correct exercises or uh, the correct dosages, the loads, because I know the trauma that the, that, that the vertebra has gone through. I know that I've seen what happens when the surgeon removes the disc for a fusion. I've seen what happens when they take uh, bone from, from the hip or the iliac crest to, to, to plant into the cage. I've seen what happens when they screw the rods and the screws in from, from the posterior aspect. Um, I've seen a posterior fusion. I've seen a laminectomy. I've seen a whole host of things. So for me, that gives me a very clear understanding as to what's happening in that person's spine because – yeah, I can look at the MRIs, but again, the MRIs are showing me just a snapshot of them lying down in a tunnel, but I've seen what's happened to them surgically, and I can correlate that as to uh, how I'm going to progress them to get them into a really good environment to function well. Um, so it's a huge learning curve, and I'm again, I'm, I'm very grateful that the surgeons who I work with are trusting of me to go in there and, 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 and act and be professional while I'm in there. Um, I've only ever once felt myself I was going to pass out. <laughs> so, um, but otherwise, I've, I've managed to stay up on, on two feet. Um, and, you know, it's, even I've seen, I've, I've seen hip arthroscopies. I've seen 
uh, groin repairs. I, I actually had a client who had a an external oblique uh, tear, and it was we just weren't getting anywhere with any type of core strengthening and and that type of thing. And I sent him to my hip surgeon, and and they did some testing, and they did the scans and CTs and everything else, and and he's he he got repaired. This was maybe about five six weeks ago. I was in surgery with him. You know, today he's he's amazing. It's it's unbelievable what what that has allowed him and I to achieve in the gym. But I've seen exactly what what happened with the repair. I've seen you know how uh, what stitches were used. I've seen what what materials were used. I've seen you know how he was stitched up. I've seen what the surgeon did with regards to to manipulating the fascia before he sewed him up. Um, so for me, that just enhances my ability to assist him in the gym would would you say it would be accurate that that's almost uh potentially the very beginning of your evaluation process for for an individual that like if you're going to work with them in the gym because you're able to observe and see some of that um at least you're going to have a much better understanding of of the trauma that they've been exposed to and then the repair of the injury well, I generally get to see uh, the patients. I either know them mm-hmm. um, or they are patients that uh, may get referred to me in the future. I don't know that. So uh, for the patients who are already my clients, I've already done the evaluation process. I've gone through the assessment protocol and everything else. Uh, it just gives me a clearer understanding how to then progress them uh, post-surgery. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not sitting here giving two thumbs up to everyone who's got a, a, a problem should go in and get their spine fused. Uh, I don't believe that. But there are sometimes it and and Stu will Stu will back me up on this. There are times where a particular patient does require a surgical intervention, uh, and and most of the time when I get to see that they come out and my work becomes way more beneficial because some type of function has been restored. So, and post-surgery, will I do an assessment again? Absolutely. I'll take them through an assessment process again. Uh, I'll get to see, uh, you know, what, what the joint is now able to do and what it's not uh, not able to do uh, because things would have changed versus their time with me prior to the surgery. Um, and then obviously for the people whom I don't know before I see them at surgery, when they do get referred to me, sure, I've uh, you know I still need to do my my, my biomechanical assessment uh, and my movement assessment, but I now know what has happened in their spine. Because don't for once think, and you know um, I'm, I'm sure uh, no one thinks this, but minimally invasive surgery is only minimally invasive for the surgeon, not for the patient, right? right? Because it's still very invasive. Anything being stuck into your spine or to, into any of your joints is very invasive. It just means that the surgeon doesn't have to cut you open to a degree that he had to cut you open 20 years ago. So he can now use micro instruments. So for him, it's minimally invasive, or him or her, but not for, not for the patient. There's, there's a whole bunch of trauma that goes on. And all type of surgery, regardless of how big or small it is on, on a scale of uh, of of a medical intervention is traumatic. Um, so when I get to see the surgery, I get to see how the client recovers. I get to see um, uh, I get to see a whole host of things. You know, when when the surgeon says, "Look, Joel, you know, can can you see I've uh, I've moved the the descending aorta out the way? Can you see ah oh, he's got some some adhesions over here? Or can you see how the sciatic nerve has been? There's some adhesions from the the, the disc herniation on the sciatic nerve as I pull the the, the disc out. So, you know, we, we get to see a whole host of things like that. Man. Wow. Um, it's, it's very informative. Yeah. I, I've, yeah. It sounds incredible to, to be able to see that hands on and then, you know, have the opportunity to work with that individual on the training room floor and really, you know, really restore some health and function for them in their life. Yeah. That's yeah. Incredible. Yeah. Um, so I guess my, the, the next kind of logical question in this is, so after you, um, have the opportunity to kind of observe a, a, a spinal surgery, uh, or any surgery of that nature, 
you know, what, what's your, what's your kind of thought process? You, you might do a, a you said the a post rehab uh, evaluation. Um, you know, obviously this is very, very different than an individual that is um, training for performance or just, you know, sort of staying sure. in good health. So, sure. You know, what, what's your thought process in terms of how to progress them safely um, you know, is there some, you know, principles or guidelines that you may have for other, uh, strength and conditioning coaches or, or individuals working with, um, people coming out of surgery or, or post rehab setting? Sure. So the very first thing that occurs to me, Joe is, uh, and I, I'm stealing this directly from Buddy Morris, who is the strength and conditioning coach for the Arizona Cardinals. So I was watching a, I was watching a, a presentation that Buddy did a few, a few months back. And he said something that uh, I've never really um, uh, written it down on a piece of paper, but I've always thought this. And he said whenever he works with his athletes, in his mind, he always starts slow and then goes fast. He starts easy and then goes hard. He starts light and then goes heavy, which is obvious. You know, I'm not telling you anything that's earth shattering or groundbreaking, but so many people don't adhere to those rules. So. Generally, when someone comes to see me post-operatively, uh, for me, if I can if I can just start them off slowly and get them to again, it's it's motor skill acquisition because things have changed again post-surgery, uh, and just get them to uh, lessen their anxiousness and their nervousness, and just gently guide them on a very progressive step-by-step basis into getting them back into doing their things, um, that generally works really well. Now, that's a principle that I apply with people preoperatively as well. So it, it's not very different. Um, but the difference for me is, for example, if someone uh, sees me and then has to have a fusion or is or has a fusion and then comes to see me, uh, and let's say they, they do a two-level fusion. Let's say they fuse L4 and L5 and L5 and S1 in the lumbar spine. Things have changed. Because now you've, you've taken segmental motion away from two segments in the spine, but now that motion doesn't just leave the body. It's got to go somewhere. And inevitably, it goes to the joint above. So long term, if we don't look after that patient, knowing that structurally and functionally things have changed in the spine, then inevitably L3 is going to go. And they're going to start having issues at L3 then potentially L2 is going to go. So I've always got that in mind that their structure, sometimes their structure and function is restored really well. So some people that have got fractures in their spine, which is called, uh, which I'm sure you know, it's called spondylolisthesis. Some people do really well with effusion because you lose your lordotic arch with spondylolisthesis. And an L5-S1 fusion can generally restore that lordotic arch. And they are better post-operatively than they were before they had an intervention. But a lot of people are offered fusions because they failed with other therapies and, uh, you know, they've only had some disc herniations. And unfortunately, they are put into the hands of surgeons who, um, who perform fusions when a fusion is not necessarily uh, needed. And so naturally, their function is going to change postoperatively. So in my mind, um, I take that into consideration because I've seen what has happened. I've seen how, you know, how uh, the, 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 the joints have now been fused. And in my mind, I start creating an image as to how these people are, are going to start putting stress through their spine very differently. Um, so it's again, it's, 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 a, it's a huge um, it's a huge information dump for me. When I go see a surgical procedure and uh, it, it, it puts me in, funny enough, it puts me into a very calm disposition when I see the patient. Because if I'm calm and I'm very confident about what I'm giving them, they're generally going to succeed and win because they, they've got confidence in knowing that I know what I'm doing and also that I've seen them and, you know, it puts their mind at ease. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm sure, you know, knowing that, that you were there observing uh, you know, the surgery, there's a, there's probably a, um, a level of trust off the bat, you know, because sure. that person, that, that rapport, which, which, you know, is, is just so critical in helping to really make progress. 
Absolutely. And uh, so, so for me, again, it, it all just fits into to how I do business. You know, um, I, I don't see it. Sitting and observing surgery is not is not different to me being on the floor with my with my patients or, or being in the room and doing a, a McGill assessment or anything like that. It's it's all it's all one and the same, you know. Um, to 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 steal something again from a from a dear friend from Charlie Weingroff, you know, he talks about lateralizations and regressions. In my mind, I use it differently, but it, it for me, it's just a it's just a regression, uh, and then you know I'm I'm going to progress them from there. It's uh, it's it it's all one and the same thing. Excellent, outstanding stuff. Thank you so much. No um, worries. So. Is there anything else that you want to touch on in regards to uh, any of this, the subject matter we've discussed so far before we kind of shift major gears to, to our last topic? No, no, no. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Okay. So. All right. So the, the last part of our, our conversation here, we have kind of uh, centered around rowing. So you um, had the opportunity to, to work with, the South African rowing team, and I believe it was in preparation for Sydney or Athens. For Athens, for Athens, so 2004. So, um, you know, yeah. one, what what was that experience like? And then, you know, what what are some of the the things that that you uh, had those athletes do from a strength and conditioning perspective um, back then? And and you know, what, what did you learn? Would you change anything? Would you do the same things? Uh, great question, Joe. You know, firstly, uh, the very fact that I was privy to being one of the strength conditioning coaches uh, to these two guys, um, I'll mention their names, it was Donovan Sesh and Ramon de Clemente, uh, was probably one of the greatest times of my career because, firstly, they are extremely good men they are gentlemen they are athletes they are they just they they good souls uh and also they are absolute workhorses it was unbelievable to see how these guys you know if we gave them a program there was never never any hassles no complaints put your head down coming to the gym and man they were rock and rolling it was incredible. So it, it truly was a standout time in my career, one, one, uh, one of the standout times of my career. Um, and I was very lucky because my business partner was the main strength and conditioning coach, and I was the assistant, and he, and, and he called me, in and we, we worked really well together. So also it was a time where I got to know my business partner even better than I did, and, and I, I knew him really, really well for, for our time together. Um, and also it was a time for creativity because again, we never had access to the internet and, uh, to a whole host of programs or, or even Skype where we could speak to, you know, uh, a, a rowing professional and just get some ideas. So there was a lot of trial and error, Joe. Um, but the thing that I'll never forget was the primary thought process for my business partner's name is Mark, or uh, my, my ex-business partner is Mark. But the primary th- uh, the thought process that, that Mark and I sort of tried to instill with regards to the program was to never get the rowers to leave their best in the gym. Because the gym and the strength and conditioning side of things was an addition to their skill and on the water training. And I think what a lot of athletes do is they take the gym side so seriously and they take it to to the absolute maximum that by the time they get back, if we're talking rowing, they get back on the water or they get back into the boat, they've already left their best in the gym and they haven't taken it to the boat with them. So we always were very cognizant and very aware that we were trying to extract athleticism from the guys, but never to the point of where we broke them down so that the following day they just couldn't row properly or, or, or they were in a position where their, their, their injury risk was, was increased. What we did with them, uh, if my memory serves me correct, it was quite a while now, um, was we, we did quite a lot of explosive work with them. Now, here you're dealing with guys who are six foot two and, you know, they, 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 they were the heavyweight boys. So 
we didn't have the time to teach them high level Olympic lifting because as you know, and, and, and it's, I think hopefully most strength and conditioning coaches know that Olympic lifting and their derivatives are highly skilled movements. And they, it's a sport and a skill in and of itself. And sometimes doesn't necessarily translate very well into utilizing it with athletes. So we did use some of the Olympic lifts, but we would use dumbbells instead because at that stage in South Africa, kettlebells weren't a big thing. In fact, you couldn't even get a kettlebell in South Africa back in 2004. <laughs> uh, so a lot would change now if I was dealing with Roman and Don versus what I was doing or at least what Mark and I were doing with them back in 2000 and, and well, from Sydney to 2004. But what we were really trying to do is just trying to get them to extract as much explosiveness uh, as possible and hopefully get that to translate into a really fast, uh, I, I'm not a rower, but would you, would you call it your, your, your takeoff? Um, you uh, know, as you start from the, so the, you're talking about the beginning of the, the yes. catch yeah. and then the drive phase of the rowing stroke. So yes, they're, but, they're but pushing but, but, with the hips and the legs. Yes. But what, what do you call that? You know, when, when, the, when they, when they drive their first stroke in and they get going to basically the, the, the takeoff or the, oh, the start, the start, the start. Yeah. The start. Okay. So we, we were trying to get them because, because their weakness was, um, getting getting out of the starting blocks really quickly. Mm -hmm. But they would catch you up, you know, a thousand meters in and they, they, they were good to go. You know, these these were boys were workhorses. So we were really trying to extract as much explosiveness to get them out of the start blocks as quickly as we could. Uh, and obviously that 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 proves a, a whole host of, of of issues because you know either they inherently explosive or they're inherently more geared toward high levels of endurance. Uh, and, and if they get more toward high levels of endurance, how much explosivity can you really extract from that athlete? You know, is it a, is it a futile attempt at trying to do it? So there was a lot of trial and error, but the key was never to overtrain them and never to put them in a position where they were at risk of injury. Now, if I was in a position where I had 12 years under my belt, under the tutelage of uh, Prof. McGill. Uh, I would choose different strategies for how they would do their daily activities because I think, a, I think a lot of the guys are quite casual, especially elite athletes, are quite casual when they are not doing their sport or they're not in the gym. So, you know, how they look after their spine with regards to, um, yeah, as Prof would call, spinal hygiene. Um, and also, the big thing is first thing in the morning. You know, if you're going to get onto, I know in South Africa, the best time for the rowers to get onto, onto the water was, you know, 5.36 a.m. Now, had I known a little bit more at that stage, I probably would have said to them, listen, if you guys are going to row at six, that's cool but you've got to get up at 4.30. I want you up at 4.30. I want you moving around. And if that means you need to go to sleep at 8, at 8 p.m. the night before, you guys are Olympians. Then so be it. So you then just needed to retro work that to say, I'm going to go to sleep earlier so that I can get up earlier so that by the time I get to the water, right, I've, I've lessened that, 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 that hydrostatic increase in, in my discs and I'm better able to, to negotiate you know, a, f a few rounds of 2000 meters without, you know, without potentially causing any, any issues in my spine. Um, so th that for me would have been, uh, quite a, quite a big piece of the puzzle was how do I look after these boys when they're not in the gym and when they're not on the boat? Um, because I think a lot of people, Joe, use up a huge amount of capacity before they even start their endeavor, whether it be rowing or, 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 or their gym training. Mm -hmm. They start, you know, I, I've, I've now believe I have a, a famous saying at the moment. I say everyone wants to be a Land Rover, but they, they, they're working off a mini engine. So if the rower wants to really be a Land Rover and get into that boat with as much capacity as possible, they've got to look at all the little things that they do during the day to make sure that they don't 
they don't use up that capacity doing stupid things so that they can get onto the boat or onto the water with a huge amount of capacity to extract their athleticism. And I think that's really a, a point that's often overlooked. Um, so that, that's, that's what I would say would, would, would be uh, really different if I, if I had the um, opportunity to train people like that again you know, the, these days. Yeah, excellent. Those are those are great points. Um, one that I would just expand on. I've, I've I've written about this. I know exactly what you're talking about, but just so the audience knows, if they're not familiar and they're listening, they'll be listening to this episode. So, what Joel is referring to is um, either waking up earlier for a six a.m. training session, or potentially even moving that training session to a little bit later in the morning if you're waking up at the same time is the uh, the first hour upon waking up the the introvertible discs are the most hydrated so they they suck up a lot of water and fluid overnight while we're asleep and so um they have a little bit more um they're, they're not as uh ready to to kind of move especially through the rowing stroke as you will where that requires that you know hinging through the hip and and getting the shoulders in front of the hip and really whipping whipping the body uh across like that so that first hour um that fluid comes down so giving your body an hour or so to kind of warm up move around remove some of that uh interval introvertebral fluid that is built up over the course of the eight nine hours of sleep the night before let it dissipate that way you can go into that training session ready to go is that correct accurate? pretty much joe yeah pretty much it's it's you know, just your spine doesn't particularly like high levels of forceful bending and extending and twisting first thing in the morning. So, you know, if, if the rowers, or, or, and I know that's probably the majority of your audience, if they, uh, if they were to negotiate their schedule, as you've just said, to, to allow them uh, a better environment or spinal environment to extract the athleticism from the boat, then you know th th that's what they've got to look to negotiate, and those are the little hidden gems that people miss because people want to they want to look at the exciting stuff like you know what am I doing in the gym? Am I clean and jerking? Am I you know am I doing a snatch? You know a am I doing a, a, a twenty eight inch plyo box jump and all those type of things? But you need capacity to do that. Now now don't get me wrong, I sell exercise and I sell high level exercise and I do all those type of things. But you've always got to look at what is the tolerable capacity of that athlete to do their endeavor successfully. And success for me is based on minimizing injuries because you are only as good as your ability to recover and your ability to offset injury. So it's, it's, all, the, it's all the hidden things that people don't look for, uh, all the little gems, the, the unexciting things that really – uh, the great coaches um, are the ones that 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 find those little golden nuggets and apply it to their athletes. And um, again, the the athletes generally will buy in if what you are selling them makes sense. You know, if you if you're selling them the the ability to look after themselves for the other 22 hours a day, um, so that they've got the two hours in the water with their tolerable capacity having increased. Why not, man? It's extra, it's extra, you know, it's extra it's sort of voomer in your engine. That's right. And, yeah. uh, and, the, and that's what people need to look at. Yeah. And at that level, that, that one, one percent makes all the difference or it can make all the difference. Yeah. Big time, big time. So, so, you know, to, to answer your question the roundabout way, it, it really would be looking at all those little things. Um, and then obviously again, you know, what I would do in the, in the gym these days is probably quite different to what I did, you know, 13, 14 years ago. However, um, my, you know, my mentor and my, my, my then business partner was a, a, a very precise coach, uh, very, very smart. And um, we, we didn't really do anything very different to what I do now. Now, I suppose I've, I've just expanded my toolbox and I've got more reasoning as to and verification as to why i do things um but uh we've always lived in a world of really good biomechanics and, and not really prepared to to 
shortchange our clients and or athletes. Excellent advice. Outstanding. Joel, do you got anything to add on any other topics that we've discussed before we move to the rapid fire? Um, no, Joe, I think, I think I've, I've, uh, I've covered everything that you've asked me to cover. Uh, I hope what I've said is, has made sense and it's been useful to, uh, to your listeners. Yeah, I, I've learned a ton. So this has been a lot of fun so far. So appreciate, Good man. appreciate the time. Pleasure. Pleasure. Um, all right, here we go. First, first rapid fire question. Okay. So Joel, given, uh, all the knowledge and experience you've accumulated, uh, up to this point in your life, if you go back in time, what one piece of advice would you give yourself 15 years ago? Joe, a very good friend of mine uh, once said to me, I- I'm a father, I've got two kids. And we were talking and he said to me, and I said, you know, I, I really, I'd love to give my kids everything I never had. And he-, he turned around to me and he said, Joel, don't be quick to give your kids the things you never had. Because it's the things you never had that made you the man that you are today. So if I could work off that, Joe, there are certain things I'd like to change. But overall, there's really not much because all the mistakes that I've made over the last 24 years have allowed me to sit opposite you here being interviewed for the podcast. So, you know, it's just it's taking recognition um of the things that i know and the things that i don't know um but there's really there's really not much i would i would i would want to change in my career awesome i like that answer too that was good um if you had to pick one and this isn't and i'll preface this this isn't for a a client okay this is for like you what's your favorite strength training exercise if I had to pick one, what's my my favorite strength training exercise? Um, I've actually got two. Okay. All right. So number one would be the back squat. Okay. Uh, which unfortunately I can't do anymore because um, because of my back. Um, and number two would be anything that involves hamstrings via knee flexion. So lying leg curl, kneeling leg curl. Um, uh, uh, upright leg curl. Um, I just, I, I've got this fascination with just uh, pump, pumping my hamstrings as much as I can. So, and from 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 a knee flexion perspective, I love it. It's just, um, I, I'm totally obsessed with those movements. I don't know why. Just, I just am. Cool. Um, you you mentioned the the back injury, uh, so. Uh, you know, how did that injury affect your training and your life and, you know, how you've, how you've, uh, recovered from it? Oh, it's, the injury made me very smart. <laughs> it made me very smart. So it, it made me realize the, the difference between performance and health. Um, and it's made me, it's made me look at the health of my body and the health of my joints um, with, with, with a lot more intent and a lot more scrutiny. Um, so, so, so now it's, uh, so Joe, I've got quite a, quite a bad injury in my back. Uh, the hardest intervention I've ever had is a couple of Advils. I've never had, uh, you know, uh, needles prodded into my back or anything like that. And, and, and Stu has been the, the main catalyst in, in, in getting me to look after my spine. Um, I get pain here and there, but it's generally very manageable. I still train, I still load, but I'm very smart in 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 the uh, the, the 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 intensity. I'm very smart in the progressions. I'm very smart. To, just when I say smart for my own back, in also how much and how frequent I load. So um, it's 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 made me very aware of of all the weaknesses that I've got in the other parts of my body. And now my training is all based on working on those weaknesses and getting everything else strong. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, what do you feel is one thing that junior athletes should be doing more of to complement their training and their health? So when I say junior, probably, 
you know, 14 to, you know, maybe early 20s? Listening to their elders. <laughs> because, because I deal with a lot of young athletes, Joe. And the, the, the thing is, uh, a lot of young athletes um, have got access to a whole host of information. Yeah. They don't have access to knowledge. And their coaches that have got gray hair, they've got the wisdom, they've got the knowledge, they've done all the mistakes. And unfortunately, I get to see a lot of young athletes that they think they know what they're talking about. Uh, they think they can survive on, you know, five or six hours sleep a night or, you know, leave their phone on and, 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 and text at four in the morning because they're going to miss out something, you know, that's happening in, on their social circle. But I think they need to, I think they need to listen to their elders a little bit more carefully, um, and, and have that respect for people that have got mileage under their belt. That's excellent advice. And, and I just wrote down that quote. Um, I love that one that you just said is that, that kids have a lot of access to information these days, but they don't have a lot of access to knowledge. Yeah. And that is a very subtle, but powerful distinction there. Thank you, sir. <laughs> yeah, that was good. That was good. I like that one. Um, good man. What's your best tip to improve recovery post training session? Uh, whew, okay. Um, so I can give you my best tip, whether people follow it or not, I don't know. So I'm going to give you the, the, the most useful tip is um, look after your sleep. And I know everyone says that. I know, you know, it's, it's going around and, and, and it's, again, nothing earth shattering or, 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 or groundbreaking. But honestly, I don't think people these days um, sleep really well. And I know if I don't sleep well, and I'm, I'm very protective of my sleep. If I don't sleep well, um, inevitably the next day I'm, you know, I'm, I'm dragging my feet on the floor and uh, uh, my back is not, is not functioning really well. I'm in a bit of pain. But j just be very protective and, and, and guard your sleep time really well. Um, it'll pay huge dividends. Huge. Oh, yeah, yeah I, I, I'm with you on that one, man. I'm, I'm a bit of a uh... – Grumpy bear, if I don't get my sleep. <laughs> uh, my, my kids call me grumpy even if I get eight hours uh, of sleep a night. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, you need it, man. Especially you just recover, but also just just the physical and the, the mental energy required to do some of the things that we're doing throughout the day. It's, yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Just 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 sleep. And as I say, you know, a lot of people say it, but it, it, there's there's reason why very smart people who know more about sleep than I do say sleep because they've researched it and they get to see what happens to the human body um, when it's deprived of sleep and uh, and especially now in today's world. Excellent. Uh, three more, and these will these are good ones. These are fun. Uh, what's your favorite meal? What's my favorite meal? <laughs> um, right. So if if you stuck me on a desert island um, with no with with access to only one meal, what would it be? Oh man, steak and potatoes. <laughs> That's right. That's steak right. and potatoes, That's right. and I don't care how you bring me the potatoes. They can be baked potatoes, they can be uh, mashed, they can be fries. I don't care. Just give me give me meat and potatoes. You know, I'm from South Africa. I'm a meat and potatoes man. I love it. All right, two more questions. Uh, what's one book everyone should read? The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Dr. Stephen Covey. Um, the most important thing he talks about there is the uh, character versus personality principle. Because people can change their personalities, Joe, to suit anyone, but your character is your character, and that's what people need to work on these days. I know I, I talk about myself. Um, I, I need to put way more effort into, into strengthening my character and forgetting about my personality. So... Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Excellent. I just added that one to my list. Good man. Um, okay, final question. Who who have you studied or do you continue to study in your career to improve and get better? Uh, funny enough, Stu. Stu McGill. Because 
Um, every time I meet with Stu, and that and that's often, um, he's he's always got a different slant on things. And again, most people who see his courses, they think that he's presenting the same stuff, but he's actually not because things, you know, he he grows as a person and as someone involved in the industry, and he's being exposed to a whole bunch of other inputs from the industry that maybe he wasn't exposed to 30 years ago, which in turn, um, I'm gaining access to that thought process. Um, and, and again, you know, people will think, um, you know, I'm just sort of, um, you know, just, just putting Stu on a pedestal, but I'm really not because he's a, he's a phenomenally interesting man that has a whole host of access to other very interesting people in the in the field of research and, and and exercise and science and therefore he's sort of the bottleneck for me because I can pick his brains and also the more I research other people I can share that with Stu and we can go back and forth and determine exactly you know what 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 a, what a suitable uh, protocol is for for certain people however saying that I learn from Joe. I learn from. There's so many smart people in this industry. You know, guys like my, my dear friend Charlie Weingroff to 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 a whole host of people. You know, I can't even name them or fan, but um, everyone at the Perform Better conference, uh, from from Mark Boyle to Gray Cook to, um, uh, to to everyone really. You know, you you can learn so much because uh, a lot of these people have got lots of mileage under their belt. Excellent. Awesome. Well, Joel, that takes us through uh, the interview. This has been a blast. I've had so much fun speaking with you. Good man. Me too. Yeah. So just uh, just hang on the line. Let me give you a proper goodbye off air. No worries. Thanks for listening to the Leo Training Podcast. Subscribe and get even more expert training tips at www.leotraining.io.